1986. I think that's when we did it. I made a film. I directed a couple of the Star Trek films. And one that I did was called Star Trek The Voyage Home. And it had to do with humpback whales. The story had to do with the potential extinction of humpback whales and what we did to save the species. So uh, I was contacted by the World Wildlife Fund who told me that uh, they would like me to come to Russia to show the film because the Russians were declaring a moratorium on whale hunting. And the World Wildlife Fund wanted to celebrate that event and they wanted me to help with that celebration by showing this film about the humpback whales. I had had an earlier confrontation on the, on the issue of a Russian visit. I was directing something at Universal Studios in the early 70s. Russian ambassador Anatoly Dobrynin came on the set as a visitor with, with Henry Kissinger. Kissinger had a teenage son who wanted to meet me. So they came to my set and I, I met the boy. I met Kissinger and Anatoly Dobrynin. And I said to him, my parents come from Russia. He was the classic Russian bear kind of guy, big voice, booming personality. He said, have you ever been to Russia? I said, no. Have your parents been back to Russia? He said, no. You should go to Russia. You should take your parents back for a visit. I said, OK. <laughs> so I came home and I told my folks what I just told you. And they laughed at me. They said, you're crazy. You know? <laughs> they snuck out. They wouldn't set foot in that country again for fear they'd be grabbed and thrown into jail, you know. <laughs> so that didn't work out. But then when this offer came along to go to Russia as a guest, I told them, the World Wildlife Fund, I will go, but you must get me to Zeslav. I want to see this place that I had heard so much about and, and was a big part of my life. The, the legend of Zeslav. I wanted to see what it was all about. I said, we'll get you there. My parents had a very old letter that they had held from family in Russia. Uh, they translated it for me. I gave that translation to our congressman, friend, Tony Bielinson, who was on the uh, Foreign Relations Committee. He gave the letter to the International Red Cross. They did some research and they came back and said, we have found a Nimoy in Khmelnytsky, about a two hour drive from Zeslav. So with that information, we contacted, or they contacted for me, the Khmelnytsky Nimoys, and told them we're coming. Susan and I, I, I was, uh, when all this was going on, I was directing, shooting Three Men and a Baby that I was directing. The night we finished shooting, the very next morning we were on a plane to Europe. And uh, we arrived in Moscow spent about a week there, showed the film a couple times, once at the American Embassy and once at the Russian Directors Union, which was another story in itself, very funny. <laughs> the Russians had a reputation for claiming that they had discovered and invented everything. You know? it, was a, it was a funny joke. So we showed this film at the Directors Union. We're having this very interesting discussion about the content. And one guy says, you know, this is this is not a new story. This story was sold by Boris Tomaszewski in 1917. Wonderful film called The Veils of the v whatever. I, 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 I almost laughed at it. <laughs> I thought that's, that's perfect. <laughs> anyway, <coughs> we finished with that. And uh, they assigned a guy to us who was an American who, was, who made a business in Moscow of helping Americans deal with Russian business people and the Russian government to do business together. So he was assigned as a guide to us. He spoke Russian fluently and English, of course. He was from Massachusetts. And uh, the three of us got on a plane from Moscow and flew to Lvov, got off the plane and went across town to the train station where we got on a train which traveled for about four or five hours across Ukraine to Khmelnytsky. We got to Khmelnytsky, my recollection was around midnight. We got off the train and there was nobody, we thought there was going to be somebody to meet us, nobody there. Finally a guy showed up and he was not a relative, he was, he was an in-tourist guy, I think he was part of the government. And he took us to a local hotel and he said, 
you'll meet your relatives tomorrow. So we spent this night in the hotel, and uh, where they spoke no English, not a word of English, and no Yiddish. It was a very non-Jewish environment, and uh, it was kind of tough. In the morning, early, knock on the door at six o'clock in the morning, bang, 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 open the door, and here's this guy who introduces himself. He says, my name is Boris Nimoy. In Yiddish, I'm your cousin. Wow. So he said, get dressed, get ready. We got the car downstairs, we get in the car, and we're gonna go to Zeslav. He drove us to Zeslav, about a two hour drive. When we get there, there were about a dozen people standing outside a very modest, it was a very rural environment. There were still farmers with horse and wagon up and down the cobblestone streets. And uh, a very modest stucco house, about a dozen people standing outside waiting for us. A very tense atmosphere. I learned later that they were suspicious of us. They'd been told that some important people are coming from the United States to see them, and they didn't believe a word of that. They thought, why would important people be coming to look for us? You know, they thought there was some kind of a spy thing going on. They were very paranoid. Anyway, they invited us inside, and they had some food on the table, and some fruits, and some beer, some vodka, had a couple of drinks. And, uh, and I established the fact that I could speak some Yiddish. So the head of the household, after a little time, left the room, comes back with a couple of envelopes, U.S. Postage stamp. And I immediately recognized my mother's handwriting on the envelope. And he opens up this envelope in pristine condition, opens it up, and pulls out two photographs about this size four by five photographs, black and white, snapshots of kids. And he asked me if I knew who these people were. I said, these are my kinder. He says, they're my breeders kinder. Ah, and that opened the door. What was amazing about that was that the kids in those photographs were maybe seven, eight, nine, 10, 11 years old. This was in 1986, thereabouts. So the, my kids by then, who had been born in the, in the mid-50s, were in their 30s. So these photographs had been in that envelope, in that drawer for over 20 years, kept as a, as a treasured object from another world. No other contact. There had been a, a couple of letters exchanged and it had stopped. For, I don't know why. Stopped. But they held onto these, this envelope with these photographs. Once I told them who they were and who we were in relation to these kids, then we could build, begin to build a family tree. You are the grandson of so-and-so, and your grandfather was, your grandmother was such and such, and they left here and so forth. We talked a little bit about the war. Zaslav took a bad beating. It was very close to the Polish border. The Germans were in Poland and massed on the Polish-Russian border. Uh, during the war, and when the war was declared against Russia, three days later the Germans were in Zaslav, and they stayed for three and a half years. And they told me the men who survived in Zaslav were men who were away in the Russian army, who were in service, because the men in the town were obliterated. So that was the experience, that was the trip, and, and they, uh, many of them emigrated to the United States after that came to the U.S. But that was my Russian Zaslav experience. They took us to the, uh, to the graveyard, which they were very proud of. It was very neatly kept. The gravestones were kept, carefully kept. The grounds were kept nicely. A gated cemetery, small gated cemetery. And they showed me the, the headstone of my father's father, my paternal grandfather, with a picture of him that, you know, they have these uh, on the headstones, the, the pictures of the deceased on the headstone. I recognized the picture from family pictures that I'd seen. So we had that contact, spoke a little Yiddish, and we went home. And I had them record messages to my parents. But it was a, it was a mixed experience. It was a great blessing to be able to be there and be in touch with them, all these Nimoy's. Nemoy in Russia. We left uh, Moscow, got back to Moscow and flew to Paris. I was exhausted. My wife, Susan, was exhausted. I had just finished directing a movie. 
and we were looking forward to a week or more in Paris to rest and have a vacation. Got to Paris and there was a message waiting for me that my father was terminal in the hospital here in Los Angeles and uh, come home. We spent one night in Paris. The next morning we were on a plane to Los Angeles. I went to see my father in the hospital. He was already on morphine, barely conscious, and I played him these recordings. And then stayed there three or four days until he passed away. So there wasn't a lot of celebration about Russia. You know. It was all, all about my father's passing and my mother becoming a widow. And shortly after he died, she revealed that she was having stomach pains. She died six months later. I was so blessed to be able to uh, close that circle just before they passed.